In January of this year, um, I spent two weeks at a, at a simulated Mars base, so I call this talk not Mission to Mars, but Mission to uh, Mars. Um, my name is David Levine. I'm a science fiction writer. I have about 40, 40 short stories published, um, and I've won a number of awards, been nominated for or won just about every major science fiction award in the field, uh, but I don't yet have a novel. Um, but you can find my work in a lot of magazines, anthologies, and online. So in January of 2010, I spent two weeks not on the real Mars, but in a simulated Mars base located in the Utah desert near uh, Goblin, uh, Goblin Rock State Park, which is where a lot of science fiction movies have been filmed. We were in this habitat, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. The way I came to this started on December 7th of last year when I posted a list to my live journal of a number of space-related things that I would like to do someday, starting at the top with a trip to the actual International Space Station, which can be yours for only $35 million, and going all the way down to a ride on a Zeppelin. Number two on that list was a visit to the simulated Mars base, which I knew that, they, I knew that it existed, but I didn't know very much about it. And a friend of mine chimed in on the Facebook echo of this live journal post saying, I know some people at the Mars Society and I could get you involved with one of those things if you are interested. And I was interested and he and I went back and forth and after a while um, I did get a response back from somebody at the Mars Society saying, I'm, I'm not with the Mars Society anymore, but what I'd recommend that you do is just go ahead and apply uh, because sometimes people have to drop out and they need somebody to replace them. So I sent in my application on the 23rd, and on the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, I received an email back from the head of the Mars Society saying um, that I have read your resume and would like to invite you to be part of the crew on uh, January 9th through 23, which is to say two weeks later. So, <laughs> so basically she said, could you possibly make it in two weeks? And as it happens, I could. So I packed up my little bag. Uh, which is exactly as big and exactly as heavy as the airlines will allow you to take on, with a few things that I thought I might need during two weeks on Mars, including, you'll notice, the very last item is duct tape. And my goals for the two-week mission were fairly simple. As a science fiction writer, I wanted to learn those little telling details that make a science fictional story come alive. If you get the little things right, people are more willing to believe you on the big impossible things in the story. So I wanted to find out what is the inside of a space helmet smell like and how does the dust feel under your boots. I also wanted to get a great author photo and not to die. Now, you may wonder why I was so concerned about not dying, because I wasn't going to the real Mars. There wasn't any vacuum. There weren't any exploding spacecraft. But there were these guys. We'll talk a little bit about, a little bit about them later. So I became part of the crew. I was part of Mission 88 um, that had this cool mission patch. Um, the other members of the crew had already, been co had already been communicating and coordinating together for some time before I came on board. This is actually the revised patch. They had a patch with only five names on it, but this is the new one. Um, so this is Crew 88. There have been 88 different rotations uh, of two weeks or one week each at this, at this station, which has been going since about 2006. Um, Stephen Wheeler was the commander of the mission. He is a, uh, he's a university professor from DeVry University in Texas and is also uh, ex-Air Force. Laksan Siramane was the executive officer and chief engineer. He's from Sri Lanka originally, lives now in uh, the Los Angeles area. He is the VNP, VP of R&D for a major biochemical, biomedical firm. Uh, working on ways to replace damaged heart valves without having to crack open chests. Um, he is a brilliant person, uh, a, a licensed pilot, is building a gyrocopter in his basement, and one of the kindest, most generous human beings I have ever met. Paul McCall, our astronomer, is a grad student from Florida. Um, he is dedicated to becoming an astronaut, and this is just one of many steps on his road to, uh, to achieving that goal. Diego from Colombia is an electrical engineer. He is, of all of us, probably the one most likely to actually make it into space first. Um, he is right now one of the finalists for something called Mars 500, which is a simulated full 500-day mission to Mars that's happening in Moscow starting in just a few months. He is one of four European finalists for the two European spaces on the six-person mission, and they're going to spend a full 500 days in a simulated mission to Mars and back. I'm very excited, and I hope he gets in. 
Um, Bianca is a high school teacher from Belgium. Um, she is also committed to space. Uh, she's a space educator, works at a, uh, works at a, um, at a uh, planetarium, and was also selected to be Belgium's representative to the International Space Camp, which was held in Huntsville last year. And then the sixth member of the mission was me. I'm a science fiction writer, and my job on the crew was to be the crew journalist. So we were living in this habitat which is a 30-foot diameter cylinder, two stories tall. Um, and as you can see, there is a couple of outbuildings. I'll be talking about them in a minute. The, uh, the lower levels on your left, sorry, uh, yeah, the lower levels on the left, the upper levels on the right, um, you can see that there are six little, uh, six little bunks in the upper level and one large main room. Uh, this is a view from up top of the main room. That is our kitchen, our dining room, our work room, our office, uh, basically our single common space where just about everything happens. This is a view from the other end of the same room. You can see there are those uh, the stickers on the doors. Every member of every crew puts, a, puts their name tag on their door and it has become the tradition that you leave your name tag on the door when you go, there's mine. And so you can see here a history of all the people that have stayed here. Uh, this is a view to the inside of my spacious stateroom. Uh, you can see there's just about enough room to turn around there. Basically, there's a little bit of storage. There's a shelf to sleep on. And when I say shelf, I mean, I mean it's, it's a piece of plywood. Uh, you're sleeping in a sleeping bag, and there's enough room to hang up your clothes. And that's about all the private space that you have. Didn't spend a lot of time in our rooms. And you may be wondering, why is the bed so high off the ground? That's because of the room next door where the bed is underneath. So basically, what you have is you have bunk beds where half of the where the upper bunk opens onto one room and the lower bunk opens onto another room. So you've got a you've got a whole room to yourself, but there's not much room in that room. Uh, we cooked on this a three burner propane stove, which was lit with a match. <laughs> the uh, the sink here you can see the sign that says no you may not use any of the following things it includes any kind of soap. Um, the only things that were allowed to go down the drain were baking soda and a very, very biodegradable soap that they use. Um, this is because all of our water was filtered through the greenhouse for, for later reuse. Um, this is the storage area located above the bedrooms where we had all of the food and everything that we would need for our expedition. Um, there, was no, there were no resupply missions, uh, theoretically. You had to bring with you everything that you needed, and this influenced uh, what we did a lot. This is me at my duty station. Um, because of my background in high tech, um, I, I, used to work, I used to work for Intel and for McAfee and for Tektronix. Because of my background in high tech, um, I was in charge of the internet um, and the computers. And in addition to filing my journalist reports, I was also in charge of basically all of the electronics and, uh, and small plug-in buzzy things. This is our... <laughs> This is our networking station. You can see we had a couple of different Wi-Fi antennas, uh, satellite internet, um, and uh, a lot of this stuff is not connected, not working, but it's still there. This becomes a theme. Our internet connection was through this satellite dish. Um, this is the same kind of satellite that if you have friends who live out in the boonies, um, they're getting their, their internet from DirecTV or somebody like that. It's kind of slow, kind of glitchy, but it was a lot better than the other forms of communication we had, which was none. Uh, we had no landline. We had no cell service. Uh, satellite internet was our only contact with Earth. People always ask, did they put in an artificial 20-minute delay? Um, we did not have an artificial 20-minute delay. We had a very real 24-hour delay in that our mission support people were all volunteers. This is an this is entirely nonprofit, all-volunteer organization. So our mission support people were only online uh, once a day from 8 o'clock. So if you had an emergency, we had, we had some emergency protocols to contact uh, uh, remote medical people. But in general, we were completely on our own, and we only had, uh, we only had email, and that wasn't responded to very frequently. Um, so here we are in the main area, and you can just barely see in this picture two of the six webcams. Uh, we, were on, we were on webcam 24-7. Uh, it only transmitted a still image every, six, uh, every three to six minutes because of bandwidth limitations. So if you did something really stupid, there was a possibility you had not been captured. Um, but we did have somebody who, who went downstairs and, and, and said, OK, nobody, nobody come downstairs. I'm going to take a sponge bath. And then we told her, uh, you know you're on webcam. And, eh! <laughs> so, but apart from that, we had no uh, serious webcam-related incidents. 
So now we're going to go downstairs. Uh, the two most dangerous things on Mars are the ATVs and this stairwell. We've had plenty of people uh, injure themselves on this stairwell. Fortunately, nobody on my shift got hurt. Uh, this is the bottom of that same stairwell. And looking from the top of the stairwell down, um, so now we're moving from the, from the upper level, which is on your left, to the lower level, which is on your right. Looking from the top of the stairs, this is their science area. This is actually quite a well-equipped science lab. There was an autoclave and a glove box and, uh, and a number of biomedical and, uh, and biological and geological uh, experiment stations. It, it's quite well-equipped. Our particular group didn't have a bio or geo scientists, so we weren't making full use of this material, but it was available for a lot of the other teams have people who are more focused on these areas. So we get downstairs, turning back to look at the ladder. The door you see to your right leads into the EVA preparation room, which is where the spacesuits are racked. Yes, we had to have spacesuits. We were not allowed while we were in simulation to go outside onto the desert surface without wearing a suit. This is another view of the suit area. And on the left, you can just barely see the airlock door to the outside. Going through into the airlock, you can see it's, 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 all, it's all simulated, but it's all designed to give you the feeling of actually being on Mars. But we're not going to go outside just yet. Now we're going to turn around, go back out of the EVA room into the science lab, which is also our engineering work area and around back to the engineering airlock. Two airlocks, one front, one back. Uh, the engineering airlock is located in the engineering area, and to the left there you see all of the stuff, all of the tools and materials and equipment that we had to keep the HAB going. It's, it's a lot like living in an isolated cabin where you're responsible for maintaining and repairing all your own stuff, and there is no possibility of going back to Home Depot or what have you in case you got the wrong size bolts. You have to make do with what you have. Therefore, nothing ever gets thrown away. You bring with you what you think you need, and anything that you can't use, you put it on the shelf or you put it in a box or you throw it out back in what we call the Arctic pile because it might come in handy later on. Also in the engineering area, you can see just past those wrenches, is the one bathroom that the six of us were sharing for two weeks. And that wooden thing on the wall there is the hand pump, which you use to pump water to flush the toilet. The water that we used in the sinks and in the shower when the shower was working would be run down through the greenhouse and filtered through a couple of different layers of plants, which I'll show you in a minute, to produce what we call gray water. Gray water was not drinkable. Uh, the International Space Station has a recycling system that can turn gray water into drinkable water, but it costs $250 million. We can't do that, but we did have this recirculating gray water system in order to give us some idea of what it would be like to be dealing with this. So you had to manually pump water into the toilet in order to flush it, and you had to pump 50 times. I counted them. And there's this sign over the toilet that says, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it, flush it down. Water was scarce. Our water was delivered in a, in a tank truck. Um, a, a, small, a small tank on a trailer once every week or so. And so we had to really conserve our water. But at the same time, we couldn't conserve it too much or the greenhouse would die because it wasn't getting enough water. So it, it's a real balance. Water on Mars is a constant problem. And too much water can be as much of a problem as too little. We also had a shower, but as I said, the, uh, there'd been a, a hard, hard freeze the week before we arrived. And so the pipe burst. And so the shower was out of commission our year, so our, our week. So uh, we, were, we were just reduced to sponge baths. So we're going out the back door, the engineering airlock, and now we're on the back porch. Now, you may be wondering how I'm standing out there in the vacuum, and the answer is that I'm not in the vacuum. I'm in this pressurized tunnel, the R.A. Heinlein Memorial Tunnel. So this, this, this is it's just a sketch of a tunnel, but it represents a pressurized tunnel that connects the HAB with the greenhouse. So we're passing through the tunnel here to the greenhouse the Oda Memorial Greenhouse. So in this space, uh, the greenhouse is divided into two areas. Uh, the front half is where you can raise plants if you're raising any plants on your, on your rotation. We did. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And in the back half is where the water is filtered. The water is filtered through three different tanks containing different kinds of water plants. And I'll give you a closer look at that sign there. You may recognize that symbol. Uh, that's actually the orchid symbol. Um, so the, so the water is filtered through several different tanks and several different layers of filters and a number of different um, bacteria 
to the point that it actually stunk much less by the time it was through with all that and we could use it for flushing the toilet. Now it may seem that going through all that work just to flush the toilet doesn't seem worthwhile, but actually something like 60% of the water that a typical house uses is used to flush the toilet. So by using recycled water to flush the toilet we could dramatically cut our water use. And in a real space station you'd be using something other than water to flush the toilet, but um, this is it's only a simulation. So. From here you can see that in addition to the HAB and the greenhouse, we also have an observatory. The path leading up to the observatory is also a uh, pressurized tunnel, quote unquote. So as long as you don't step past that line of rocks on either side, you will not die. Um, the the green the uh, sorry the observatory itself is too small to move around in inside in a spacesuit, which is why we have this pressurized tunnel. And it has, as you can see, a gorgeous view. Um, and the skies in this area are about as dark as anywhere on this continent. Uh, we had spectacular views at night. This is a this is an astronomical photograph that Bianca took, and here is a view down from the uh, from the observatory to the HAB by night. And that bright orange star you see in the upper left hand corner is actually Mars. So while we were there, we were doing real science in simulated Mars conditions. One of the projects we were working on was a micropaleontology project, which was done by uh, Steve, who was an amateur paleontologist. He would go out and climb on rocks that none of us were brave enough to clamber and come down with samples of various materials from formations that he thought might be good microfossil beds. Uh, some of his paleontologist friends said, that sounds like a great experiment, but you're not going to find anything. Well, he spent a lot of time sifting through samples and a lot of time staring through microscopes, and he did eventually actually find this. This is called an ostacod. Uh, it is a 150 million year old crustacean. Critters like this still exist today, and uh, this kind of sorting and searching and sifting and finding is something that is probably going to be one of the major things that we do when we do get to Mars, because if there was any life on Mars uh, millions of years ago, it would probably be quite small. So this, this microfossil thing, the existence of these microfossils is one of the reasons that the Mars Desert Research Station is located where it is, because there are plenty of microfossil beds in that vicinity. Another experiment we were doing was what we called the suit constraint study. Um, in this study, uh, we would go out and look for plants. Uh, we would mark out an area of the desert and then try to count, identify, and take samples of every plant in the vicinity. Everybody did the, we had four different areas and everybody did each area once and we randomized whether you would do it in a suit or not in a suit. So we did all of the non-suited parts of the study at the very beginning of the mission before we went into simulation. After that, we were all going out and doing what I call cotton picking on Mars because it was tedious, backbreaking work, crawling around hands and knees looking for all these little plant samples and I, I swear, wearing the gloves, the gloves was the worst part. Imagine dealing with Ziploc bags and, and a little pair of scissors and, and a pencil and a pad and your camera so you could record and, and write down and note down every sample that you took. I swear I, I collected my pencil a lot more often than I collected any of those plant samples. So while we were out there on our hands and knees collecting samples, Diego was monitoring the experiment, but since he was out there and we really weren't getting into much trouble, he decided that he would do a little side experiment on extremophile life forms. So he was looking for what are called extremophiles, which is to say life forms that like extreme conditions, and which involve picking up a lot of rocks and breaking them open and looking inside. In this case, he found a green line in the middle of the rock, which when examined under the microscope yielded this. This is an alga. This, act, this life form exists on Earth and lives inside of a rock where there's no light and no water. And we think that if there are life forms on Mars today, they're going to be critters like that. Another experiment that Diego, our biologist, did was growing uh, Phasalis peruviana, which is a plant that grows in Peru at very high altitudes. It's used to low air pressures. It's used to a lot of ultraviolet light. And so we thought it would be a good candidate for growing on Mars. So um, we had a number of them in the greenhouse. And unfortunately, by the end of the two weeks, only one plant had come up. So in a sense, the experiment was a success in that it had a result. But in terms of actually growing plants, not so much.
The one scientific experiment that I was most directly involved in was the reconstruction of the telescope. The radio telescope had been put up in 2006 and was built for the altitude of Jupiter above the horizon at that year. Uh, Jupiter has moved around since then, so the telescope needs to be pointed in a different direction. This type of telescope just consists of two wires held up on poles, and so the altitude at which it is focused is determined by the, al by the, the height of the wires above the ground. So what we needed to do was we needed to take it down and put it up again in an adjustable way. So this was all done in suits. We went out, we disassembled the existing radio telescope and took it down. Then we came inside and used our, our trigonometric skills to figure out how long all the guy wires needed to be and where the holes needed to be drilled. And then we drilled all the holes, measured all the guy wires, drove the, uh, the, drove the, new, uh, the new spikes in, into, the, into the Martian soil using a, a highly sophisticated astronaut tool, and then put the new one up. using, using uh, hi, again, highly sophisticated astronaut tools. And finally, there's the completed new adjustable radio telescope. And then we went inside and actually recorded this uh, signal from Jupiter. So it's not a very sophisticated instrument, but um, it's, it's, I mean, a lot of the people that come to the Mars Desert Research Station are students of one sort or another. So the radio telescope has been used by several groups that have come after us to do uh, various scientific studies. The thing that we spent the most time on each day, and the biggest pain in each day and also the most fun, was going out on extravehicular activity, going outside of the hab. When you're getting ready to go on EVA, you start off by putting on a jumpsuit. Uh, under the jumpsuit, I am wearing uh, a wool sweater, uh, wool shirt, long sleeves, uh, um, a long pants, uh, long underwear, and a wool knit cap. Um, it was very cold in January in the Utah desert. We put on these gaiters on our boots to keep the dust and sometimes mud from getting, into, from getting inside of our boots. The backpack is actually quite light in weight, but it's a bit awkward to get on. You're supposed to have somebody to help you on with it, but we got to the point that we could put it on ourselves. Now we're all set for the helmet. Um, is that the author's uh, That's one of them. I got a lot of good author photos. Um, this, okay, so you have, you have your name tag that goes on so we can identify the body when it's, when it's brought back in. Um, the things on the red, on the red lanyards are uh, keys to the ATVs. We have this large red thing on it so that in case you drop it while you're wearing your helmet and wearing your gloves, you can see it there on the ground and maybe even have a fighting chance of picking it up. And we also had handheld radios that we used for communication. So you hook up the radio, you run, you run the wire into the earphone up under the, under the ring of the helmet. Um, then you have to have somebody to help screw the, uh, screw the hoses onto your helmet. That was the one thing that you could not do for yourself. It, the angle was just too awkward. And now we're all suited up in the airlock, ready to go. And out we go onto the surface. And here we are out on the surface of Mars. And it's, it's not Mars, but with the spacesuit and the red rocks, it really felt like Mars. Uh, we, were, we were doing astronaut things. We were out collecting samples and taking lots of pictures. And it, I came home with something like 2,500 pictures after the two weeks. It, it was, it's hard not to get great photographs just, just, pointing, just pointing the picture at your friends doing all of these marvelous things. And I, I didn't think that I would really enjoy being in the desert. Um, but I really did. I really did grow to love it. It's a beautiful, hazardous. It's 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 a hazardous. It's unpleasant. It's uncomfortable. Um, I'll I'll take I'll take uh, questions later. I'll take questions at the end of the talk. Thank you. Um, but it's it's spectacular in its way. It, I, I mean, Buzz Aldrin used the term magnificent desolation when talking about the moon, and this this Utah desert really is magnificent desolation. It, it, and the colors of the rocks were constantly changing depending on atmospheric conditions and what time of day it was. Um, many different kinds of rocks, um, many different vistas, and you could, climb, you could climb on things and see for a long, long way. This particular rock just fascinates me. This is a case where you have an overlayer which is made of harder rock and underlayer made of uh, softer rock which has been eaten away over the years. We never did find out the name of that feature, but it, it's quite spectacular. And, and the rocks that you would see underfoot were red like Mars, and, and they're, they're, that's, that's a beautiful shot of the, of the hab from the ridge above. 
and the, uh, th this, is, this is the area that was known on our maps as uh, Valles Marineris. All of, I, we, have our, we have our map of the area with all these Mars names on it. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management, who owns this land, has all of their own names for this stuff, but we would call it Valles Marineris or Olympus Mons or what have you. But, but you can see just how much it looks like Mars, how, how you know, you, you've got the rocks laying around. Well, actually, this is Mars. Uh, this, is, this is an actual Mars surface shot. And apart from the fact that the real Mars is a little bit more rusty red and uh, Utah is a little bit pinker, it, you kept seeing shots that just reminded you of the shots that you'd see from the, from the actual Mars mission. So this is Utah, and this is the real Mars. You know, look, look how similar they are to each other. And you can tell the shots of the real of the of the uh, simulated Mars because they have people wandering around on them. But it was so cool, and I left my footprint on Mars. We also had, in addition to our footprints, we had these rovers. Um, this was, they, they were kind of frightening to me at first, but I really grew to love them. Um, each of these little guys had its own personality. Um, they were a lot like animals. They had, uh, you know, they were temperamental. Um, they, they, would, they would sometimes take off without you. Uh, we, had, we had some thrills, we had some spills. Uh, nobody was seriously hurt, fortunately. Um, but with the rovers, we could get out a lot farther um, and this was, uh, anybody here been to, been to Disneyland? You know the Indiana Jones ride? It felt like the Indiana Jones ride on the territory of Thunder Mountain Railroad. So after, after a long, hard day of going out and collecting rocks and, and looking, for, uh, look, looking for samples and taking lots of great photos, the sun would go down. And at the end of this day, we climbed up to, uh, to a butte right nearby and had this gorgeous amazing view. Um, this was this is just just a spectacular, just awe-inspiring vista. And so as the sun went down, we would gather our materials and head back to the HAB and come back at the end of the day. Now, when you're on Mars, things break down all the time. So I became a member of the engineering crew. Uh, usually there's only one engineer and five scientists. In this case, we really had three engineers because although I was journalist, my journalistic tasks only took up about a third of my day. So I spent the rest of my time helping to fix things. So I became the one in charge of all the small electronics, which included the backpacks. Also, when we had a crack in a space helmet, you can see that little gray rectangle near the top. That's duct tape. Um, we would repair everything we had with anything that we could get. Dealing with water was a big part of our day. Uh, we, had to pump, uh, we had to pump the gray water out of one tank and into another tank a couple of times a day. Um, you can see that, that's that piece, of, uh, piece of paper taped up on one of the tanks in the greenhouse. It says, a gray water system has recently undergone major, uh, major renovations. Do not do anything without checking with mission support first. Everything was changing all of the time because all of the systems had been built and then you go out there and something breaks and you have to fix it with whatever you've got. So the systems were constantly changing. Uh, in this case, we had to go in there with a, with a filter and hold this filter under the, under, under the pipe at a certain point in the process because the regular filtering system wasn't working. Uh, we were constantly having to fix and improvise. The, the whole thing was like, there's a scene in the movie Apollo 13 where, um, where, the, uh, where the mission support people come and they dump a whole bunch of stuff down on the table in front of the engineers and says, you have to fix, you have to make this fit into that using only this stuff. Every day on Mars is like that. And I know from talking with people who've worked on the, on the Viking missions and the, um, and the Mars rovers that this kind of improvisation is just part of space travel. Because anytime you go someplace new and someplace distant, you have to cope with whatever the environment throws at you with whatever you have with you. So it's always improvisation. It's always putting together and fixing. Now on the, on the other end of this is also a pressurized tunnel. On the other end of this pressurized tunnel is the engineering area or shed um, where we have our motor generator that keeps us in power. This runs off of diesel fuel. This, this new generator called Kitty was delivered the first day we were there. The previous crew had had very serious problems with generators. There are actually five dead generators in this pile, um, in addition to two dead generators that are behind me when I took this picture. Um, and so on day three, when our power went out, it was not completely surprised. But as we sat there with no power and no heat, uh, getting colder and colder, and as the sun was going down, it was getting darker and darker, it was kind of scary. And it really felt like we were out there on our own. 
Fortunately, this man came through to help us. This is DG. DG uh, is, is very rarely photographed. I think this is the only picture anybody has of him. Um, and he is a guy who lives in Hanksville, which is about two, three hours drive away, and comes in when the problems get too severe for us too severe for us to solve on our own. So he came in and he managed to diagnose what the problem was with the generator, which was that when we shut it down in order to change the oil, it wouldn't restart. Turns out that it was running the power system just fine, but it wasn't charging its own battery. What we wound up doing was taking a, uh, taking a trickle charger and plugging it into the outlet, running an extension cord out from the hab to a trickle charger so that the motor generator could charge itself. Constant, constant improvisation. So our water was delivered, our, our drinking water was delivered on a tank. It had to be pumped by hand from that tank into this tank, from which it could be electrically pumped up into this tank, which is located above the um, above the bedrooms. And from there, it would gravity feed down into the sinks. Um, if you didn't pay attention when you were pumping this tank full, it would overflow. And if it went above that green line at the top, the one that says "Do not exceed," then the water would run down into your bedroom. This, of course, never happened to us, right? So dealing with, dealing with water, uh, making sure that the batteries for the backup system were being charged, uh, making sure that the plants in the greenhouse did not die. Engineering is uh, pumping up, uh, keeping the, the rovers gassed and oiled. Just dealing with, with the systems of the HAB was really more than one full-time job. There were two and a half of us, and, and we were able to get ahead. Usually, most teams fall behind, so we were doing, we were doing very well. And actually, Loxon, our chief engineer, was asked to join the permanent engineering staff. And he'll be he'll be going back there in June to to get the place ready for the next uh, rotation, the next year, because they don't they don't do it during the summer. They close up they close up at the end of the season and open up again in uh, in I think about September. So our daily life, we had pretty much the same schedule every day. Uh, got got up at 7:30, uh, had breakfast and a morning briefing. Uh, we went out on a morning EVA. Uh, anything from two people to four people would go out on one or two EVAs in the morning. Uh, lunch about noon, and then usually time for two different EVAs in the afternoon. Uh, we'd get together for dinner, um, and then we'd spend the rest of the evening doing our daily reports. Uh, the HAB was equipped with uh, uh, quite a large selection of books. I took this picture because it really represents what living in the HAB is all about. We have Joy of Cooking, Fundamentals of Radiology, Microgravity Research, and the Home Improvement 123 book. Because it really is like, like living in a small cabin, except for the fact that you just can't go, uh, can't go home and get any more stuff. You're stuck with what you've got. What we were eating was dehydrated food of one sort or another. This is, this is some of it, and there's a, a lot more of it in the loft above the bedrooms. Uh, this is a fairly typical breakfast before you add the water. So that's powdered milk, dehydrated uh, fruit of some sort, looks like mangoes, a uh, little sugar, and uh, oatmeal. This is breakfast basically every day was, was oatmeal. We had a lot of other things for lunch and dinner. but um, And that thing, that large brown rectangle on the right, is a shelf-stable bread, uh, which was developed for the military and was about as tasty as you might think. Um, the dehydrated fruit was quite nice. And actually, we got in trouble with mission support because we ate more than our share of the dehydrated fruit. Um, we were able to bake. Um, if the, with the stove, which was lit with a match, um, and uh, this was this is um, I think was a was a couscous that that I that I fixed one day. Um, Diego raised us some sprouts in the greenhouse, and I have to tell you, after a week and a half of eating dehydrated food, having a simple salad of green sprouts with uh, vinaigrette and a few dehydrated onions on top was probably the best salad I've eaten in my entire life. And, and Paul was a big, big eater, as you can tell. Um, that was made by, by mixing together several different varieties of dehydrated food and adding water. And it wasn't actually quite, the, it wasn't actually that bad. Um, so this is me working on my journalistic, uh, on my journalistic duties. We had a lot of reports. We all had a lot of reports to do. Um, these were filed over a web form to the Mars Society server back in Boston. Um, so I did my journalist report every day. Um, there was also, I also copied my journalist reports to my live journal for my friends and family, and a lot of other people, of course, have read them online. Um, we had the engineering report, which listed all of the water levels and gasoline levels and diesel levels and oil levels of all the systems, and just was a quick checklist of everything that might conceivably go wrong so the people back home could know what the state of the HAB was. 
Um, we had an EVA report that the person who was in charge of any individual EVA would fill out about where did you go, how long did it take, what did you do. Um, there was the science report for each of the science experiments that was ongoing. We had to have file a science report every day. Um, we had to upload photographs to the Mars Society for their use on their web page. Uh, we had our daily, uh, our, was this the food study? Yes, this is the food study. We had to fill out uh, a survey on what we ate every single day and how we felt about it. Um, we had the HAB architecture study, which we filled out twice a week, was what do you think about this space that you're living in? Are any changes that you would make? How long do you think you could live in this space before we're going insane? Hopefully the answer is more than two weeks. Um, this was the uh, report that we filled out after each of our suit constraint studies. Um, and the uh, inventory of all the food, what had we eaten, what was remaining, and the uh, quick guide that I wrote. Now, I was a technical writer for a lot of years, um, and so when I got here and I discovered how messed up and undocumented the HAB systems were, because there was plenty of documentation. We had binders and binders and binders of documentation, every one of which was out of date, even if it was only a couple of months old, because the HAB systems were constantly changing. So I wrote up these quick guides, which were one-page bullet lists of this is what this is what you need to do every day and if something goes wrong this is what to do about it because we had lots of background material but no very focused usable documentation so i wrote about a dozen of these quick guides and laminated them and left them and i left the file on the computer in the hab saying with explicit instructions to say whenever anything changes you need to update the quick guides and i've gotten feedback from people that have followed that this has been incredibly valuable to them so technical writing saves the day for sure so this is why, if you looked in on the webcam uh, at any point during my two-week mission, you would probably see me sitting at my computer type, 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 typing away. But then, at the end of the day, we were on Mars, and we had this marvelous view out of our portholes every day. So what did I learn from my two weeks on Mars? Shared adversity creates strong relationships. We were out there all by ourselves. There were six of us, and we were dependent on each other. Nobody else could tell us what to do. Nobody else could help us. We had to depend on each other, and we got, we got really, really close. We were like a family. The isolation, our, our great distance from any kind, of, any kind of shop, anybody that could help us, forced us to become ingenious, to improvise, to be self-reliant. And what I called protagonistiness which is behaving like the protagonist. The protagonist of a story is somebody who takes actions that change the plot. You have to, when you see a problem beginning to occur, you learn to take action. You learn to see that problem and take action to do something about it. You do not wait for approval. You do not ask somebody to help. You do not assume that somebody else will deal with it. You deal with it yourself. And I, just as an example, when we came back, uh, I was having breakfast in the hotel um, on the way home, and I spilled coffee. And I immediately grabbed a rag and mopped up the coffee and put everything away. Never even occurred to me to ask somebody from the restaurant to clean the, to clean the mess up. I was just totally in that mode of everything that happens is my responsibility. But I did not die. I got this fabulous author photo, and I made my new Morris family. These, these people are people who will be important to me for the rest of my life, and I'm so glad to have met them. So, this is me. So, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Yes? This is so cool. I have so many questions. I have to pick one, I guess, for now. So, uh, I guess it would be when when I see, like, videos and like articles about the space station, they, they don't rotate the whole crew at once, I guess not to keep, not to bring like a pack of four or five new people to right. this environment. Yeah. Did anything like this, is anything like this considered for this? Like We um, actually, that was, that is exactly one of the recommendations that we made to the Mars Society is that um, when you come in, the, um, you fly to Grand Junction, Colorado, which is the nearest, nearest town with any excuse me, nearest town with any kind of airport. And then you rent a car and you drive about three hours to the HAB. Uh, you have the handover, exchange crews. The old crew takes the car and drives back to Grand Junction. That takes about three hours. So because of that three hour drive, you've got maybe a couple of hours for the handover, during which time you have to try to tell the new crew everything you couldn't write down. And a lot of information gets lost in this big game of telephone. 
So we were saying, we, we recommended to the Mars Society that rather than rotate the entire crew, that you have, um, you, you, you have some people stay over into the next crew. And that is exactly what they do on the International Space Station. And you've got to have that, that continuity, that, uh, that institutional memory, because we made a lot of mistakes in our first couple of days. And looking at the reports from uh, subsequent crews, I see again and again people make mistakes in the first couple of days. That's when, if you were to have the tank overflow and run down into your room, that's when it would happen if it happened, which it didn't happen to us. <laughs> Officially, um, so yeah, that's an excellent thing that they do on the space station, and and I would, I, you know, I wish we could do it. The, the economics, the whole thing's really run on a shoestring. The the hab cost, uh, I think, two million dollars, which was donated by a couple of large donors, but all all of the maintenance. And, and everything going forward is all done on, on donations. And so uh, there's never enough money to do anything the way that you would like to do. And so just the difference between renting a car to drive all the way out there and back once every two weeks, as opposed to every week, which you would want to do to have that handover, to, to, have, to have overlapping crews, you know, that's, that's one of the areas where they've, they've had to cut back. And also, each crew is independent. Um, our crew belong to the Mars Society, but a lot of the other ones are sent by. Georgia Tech sends out a crew, and the uh, Mars Society Europe sent out a crew, and, and, and uh, there are a number of different organizations that, have, that field a full crew of six. If you had overlapping personnel, you couldn't do it quite that way. So there's all kinds of reasons they do it this way, but I think for practicality's sake, it would be better if they did, if they did have overlap. Yes? Oh, me. Yeah, you. Uh, you know, to me, I think the most amazing thing is that at your age and level of education, you still have trigonometric skills. Yes. <laughs> most, yes. most of us have lost them long ago. Yes, yes. Well, Dave, I'm, yeah. see, this, see this watch? Trig yeah. functions. Okay. This is, this is a, this is a 19, 1980 vintage geek watch with trigonometric functions. Um, and, and, all, and actually, you know, we all, we all did. I mean, Paul's an electrical engineer. Um, uh, Loxon is also is also an engineer, although he's mostly a manager these days. We all we all had those skills, and between us, we managed to remember the formulas. Okay, David, you're a writer and a reader. What books did you take with you? Um, I did not. T let's see. What I only took. Well, I took I took a copy of Space Magic, my award-winning collection of short stories, um, which which I, I don't I don't know if I don't know if you can if you can sell books here, but I actually have copies. Um, and uh, I brought. I did not bring a copy of Red Mars. Green Mars, Blue Mars, um, but there were copies in the library there. Um, honestly, I only brought one book for, for, for leisure reading, and I'd never cracked it. I couldn't tell you what it was. Good question, though. Yes? Hi. Um, two questions. The first question is, uh, um, what did you have in your backpacks along with your spacesuit? Right. Was it artificially weighed down? Yeah. or? Fortunately, no. Um, the, the, art, the, the backpack... When I went in to repair the backpack, backpack for the first time, I was really surprised because under that quilted cloth cover is, you know those, you know those plastic bins you put shoes in and slip under your bed? That was what it was under the cover. And in that bin was two muffin fans like you'd find inside your typical PC, um, a rechargeable 12-volt battery about that big, uh, a switch and a fuse. The rest of it was entirely empty. But the airflow through that empty space was such that the air would come in, would actually cool off your back, which is nice during the, during the warmer parts of the rotation, and then be, be pumped into the helmet. So it was really, a, you know, the bulk of the pack was mostly just for visual effect. Um, but keep in mind, of course, that on Mars it would only weigh one third of what it does on Earth. So that pack is mostly empty, but it was functional. And the second question is, uh, why did you have to do that much paperwork? Who was reading all of that stuff? Um, a lot of the paperwork that we were doing was for the Mars Society itself. Filing those reports kept us honest um, and made sure that if anything got broken, they would know about it so that they could maybe send along some replacement parts with the, with the following people, um, with the next, the next rotation. Because people, people were able to pick something up um, at the airport, or at the in Grand Junction on their way out. Um, so, they, so they could also offer advice if anything went wrong. And having a daily report would let them know if things were happening that they would consider problems even if we didn't. 
Um, and it was basically just to keep us honest and focused. Um, and also it's public relations outreach. The same reason we have those webcams, which are publicly visible. Also, all of those reports that we posted went up on a web page that's publicly visible so that people can follow along at home on the mission. And I know that people were reading my reports and, and looking at the webcams and reading my blogs because I got email about it a lot. Um, we were bandwidth limited. We were extremely bandwidth limited, but each of us was instructed, you will get a, a separate, a special Gmail account especially for the mission. And you will not have your regular email forwarded to that account either. You will only give that account to people that you that you know will not abuse it. So we were we had a we had an account where we could read a limited amount of email and we were explicitly told not to use and not to use Hotmail or Yahoo Mail or any of the other things, use Gmail because it's so bandwidth efficient. Oh yes, yeah. So uh, some of the other paperwork that we were doing, um, the architecture study and the food study, were being done by researchers at, uh, I believe, at the Johnson Space Center. Um, this is not an official NASA thing, but there are a lot of people who work for NASA, who work for JPL, who work for Lockheed, who are doing this on their own hook, and uh, and they're getting and and they they get the time off from their bosses because the bosses also think that it'll be valuable for them. So there's a lot to be learned about about what it's actually like to live in these environments, which if you're designing space hardware, can be very helpful. It, it gives you a, a visceral gut impression of what things are like that's a lot more effective than anything that you might read um, read on paper. So um, so it's not, it's not NASA, but there's a lot of NASA people that are working on it, including the people that are doing the food study and the architecture study. And these things are, are being, they're being published in, in refereed journals. There is some real science coming out. Not a lot, not a lot, but there is some real science coming out of here. Yes? Um, so I remember seeing this uh, feature on uh, discovery about one of the Apollo missions when they discovered that they can hop around instead of walking, making it more efficient in the spacesuits. Yes. But they were talking there of of how they they can't really like uh, because of the hostile environment they you know every time you try something like that it's kind of you know if you fall and crack your helmet it's it's not like you're here so I was wondering if you guys did any limit yourself at all during those EVAs to like not go certain places because it might be too dangerous very in much so yes yeah um, the the priorities at the at the at the Mars Desert Research Station are safety science simulation and comfort in that order. So bottom line is if there's any question about whether or not you should do something, if it's not safe, you take you take the safer route. Um, and so there were absolutely places that were marked on the map. You do not go here um, in your in your ATVs. We had we had there was a lot of a lot of the handover information was all about how to use those ATVs safely. Um, there was, um, you know, there were protocols for going up and down that ladder because you could easily, you could easily bust yourself on that ladder. Um, there were, um, and then we would, we would experiment, but one of the reasons you report on what you've done is so that mission support can tell you, don't do that anymore. It's dangerous. Um, and the ATVs were the most dangerous thing and, and certainly, um, going out in the desert, is potentially dangerous, even if you aren't wearing a pretend spacesuit. By the way, when I when all the paperwork that I had to fill out when I when I signed up for the mission included a disclaimer that said, in approximately so many words, I acknowledge that driving around the desert in an ATV wearing a fake space helmet is really stupid. <laughs> and so you know, so we actually we actually did not wear our space helmets on the ATVs. We would take off the helmet and strap it to the rack and wear a motorcycle helmet. Um, and that's why there aren't a lot of pictures of us riding on the ATVs because we didn't want to take pictures of us not in simulation. But we did wear the helmets for, for short jaunts and we would put on the helmets for photographs. But you, you, you compromise science and simulation for safety where necessary, which is not to say we never did anything foolish, but we never did anything foolish and told mission support about it. <laughs> yes? So um, I had two questions. The first one is how did the differential plant survey work out? I mean, the, um, the okay, the, the, uh, the P. Peruviana study, um, we tried growing that plant in the greenhouse in a variety of local soils and only one seed germinated. It was intended to be an experiment that would go for several rotations because two weeks isn't a lot of time when it comes to a plant. Um, but since only one seed came up, we decided to terminate the experiment rather than ask the following, uh, ask the following team to use some of their limited time to keep going on an experiment that we'd given them. 
Uh, did, did that answer the question? No, I was actually asking about the plant survey you did, one in spacesuits and one without. Oh, that one. Um, the I don't remember. Part of the problem there is is that the uh, the person who was in charge of the survey, uh, Diego, is the one who is now in Moscow getting ready for the Mars 500. So he hasn't had a chance to assemble and publish his results. But just from my own personal experience, I'd say that I spotted and collected something in the vicinity of 40 or 50 percent as many plants in the suit as not in the suit. The biggest problem was the gloves. And the second biggest problem was the helmets. Because when you're wearing this helmet, you can't you can't wipe your nose, you can't you can't rub your eyes. Uh, if your hat starts to fall down over your head, I, I learned that, that I could kind of push my head back and, and kind of scrape it back on the back of the helmet. But in general, um, if your helmet fogged up, you know you would you could be you could be in serious trouble. And one of the other teams had uh, had some very cold weather. They had the helmets fogging up all the time, and uh, and sometimes they just had to abandon the sim and say I need to take off my helmet and clean it, otherwise I couldn't see it at all. Um, so in addition to that keeping you from seeing the plants in the first place, taking a picture of the plant and dealing with, with marking down your, your results on a piece of paper and uh, maybe holding the plant close to yourself so you can identify which plant it is. You can only get this close. You can't get this close. And that's, uh, it's a big impact. And then there's, there's, the, there's the bulkiness of the suit and the backpack and all that keeps you from moving around. And, and getting down and getting up again was all um, it, it was tedious. Like I said, it was like picking cotton on Mars. And so it was a big, big hit. Um, if we were doing it for real, we would probably have something better than holding six Ziploc bags in one hand while doing all that other stuff with the, with the other hand. If we were doing it for real, we would probably have a specialized uh, holder to hold the six bags open that would like strap to the side of your suit or something like that. But because we did the same thing in both environments, it was a fair comparison. But it was uh, it was instructive, to be sure. Some other teams, not ours, uh, there's a group in South Dakota, University of South Dakota, is doing spacesuit design work. And they send a couple of teams out a year with new prototype spacesuits, which they try out on the desert conditions. And those are those are for real. I mean, those are those are much realer spacesuits with actual oxygen supplies and everything. It's, uh, it's quite impressive. You got, you got some great pictures. And you had a second question. Yeah, the second question was, what was the environment in the greenhouse like, and was it artificially heated? The greenhouse was not artificially heated. The, the artificial, the environment in the greenhouse was, it was like any greenhouse that you might have been in. Uh, it was it was warm and, and rather moist. Uh, it was not artificially heated. Um, it was, uh, the outside is that uh, that wiggly, transparent stuff that, that greenhouses are often made of, and there was enough uh, enough solar radiation coming in through there that it was it was quite comfortable in there. It was a nice place to be, apart from the fact that it stank. Uh, so um, so the greenhouse was working as a greenhouse. In actual Mars conditions, um, the fact that you're farther from the sun is slightly compensated for by the fact that the atmosphere is so much thinner, which means that Earth plants would probably get along pretty well in a greenhouse on Mars. All you'd have to do was bring the local atmosphere, which is mostly carbon dioxide, up to a level that's comfortable for the plants, which is only like, I think about four or five PSI of carbon dioxide is enough to keep plants happy. So that's about one third of Earth atmospheric pressure. Mars surface pressure is less than 1% of Earth surface pressure, but you could enclose the plants in a, in a, in a greenhouse, um, pressurize the air a little bit, and they would be they would be able to grow, and they would not be too badly disturbed by the 24 and a half hour day. So that's that's a that's a definitely something that will that will happen if we ever do go to Mars uh, for sure as people. Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask something else, but since you brought it up, what is for for a uh, habitat on Mars? What is the uh, the the design? I guess uh, pressurized environment that you want for the humans. I mean, you don't have to have one full atmosphere, right? I mean, no, you don't. Um, I did. I've done some research on this. I've, I mean, I've been working on some fiction about Mars, obviously, um, and I've been I've been studying this. And the International Space Station is kept at uh, at ground at sea level pressure, 15 psi, not for the sake of the people, but for the sake of various experiments, because uh, a lot of the scientific equipment was built with the assumption of 15 psi. So it's just easier on all the equipment if they keep the space station at 15 psi. Apollo was one at a quite a low pressure of about, I think, like three psi of pure oxygen. 
Um, pure oxygen, as you probably know, is what killed the Apollo 1 astronauts. Mm -hmm. So they ran the they ran the capsule at a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen during launch. But once they were well above the atmosphere and away from the danger of fire, they switched over to a pure oxygen atmosphere and ran on pure oxygen for the rest of the mission. Um, pure oxygen is perfectly uh, perfectly breathable for people. At 20%? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think it, you know, 20%. 20% atmosphere. Uh, yeah, our, so our atmosphere pure. is like 20% oxygen. Yeah. So if you, if you provide pure oxygen and 20% atmospheric pressure, people are perfectly happy on that. Um, as long as there's no, uh, as long as there's no uh, combustion, then it's it's quite safe. Running at a low pressure means that things like spacesuits are much easier to work in, um, and of course you don't have to transport all of that nitrogen along with you. So um, I I can't tell you what pressure a Mars habitat would be run at. Mm -hmm. There are good reasons to run it at at sea level pressures, and there's other good reasons to run it at a lower pressure. Um, the book that I would recommend is The Case for Mars by Robert Zubrin. He talks about all of this. Robert Zubrin is one of the founders of the Mars Society, and just about everything you see here is based on his ideas. Um, so he talks about all this stuff in great detail, um, and you can work it out for yourself. And, and then, you had another question? And then the other question, yeah. So uh, if you uh, look at the uh, literature, at least uh, the movies and, and TV series, on the technology level of science fiction, on one end you have like the... Star Trek, where everything is nice and shiny. On the other end of the spectrum, you have sort of the Firefly, mm -hmm. right? And you guys were like some a few levels below that. So I'm kind of wondering if that kind of spoils the effect, or do you get like how, how do you like you you're sitting on folding chairs yet you're supposed to be on this Mars facility with at least some kind of you know modern technology. So it was a little bit a little bit of a disappointment at first when you when you show up and you discover that everything is basically you know everything is made of made of wood and you have and you have the folding chest. They did as much as they could with the budget that they had to make it feel like a real space mission. Um, the I mean for example the the door on the greenhouse that you saw had the rounded corners a nice nice plastic waffle pattern with a big with a big handle in the middle. Um, what you did not see in that picture is the fact that the big handle in the middle says Fisher Price on the hub and the back of that door you can see where the legs had been taken off because it was a plastic picnic table with rounded corners. They're making very good use of limited budget in order to make it look as spacey as possible. So yeah, it's a little bit it's a little bit of a disappointment when you first get there, but the real environment, the the, the actual desert outside the portholes and and the and the spacesuits and just the knowledge of how isolated you are makes it feel Marsy, even if it didn't perhaps look as Marsy as you might like. Okay, basically I think we have time for one last question. It's probably just worth mentioning that there's the other station, F Mars, which is the Arctic. And yes, like thank you. Really, yes. really. Yeah, the Mars Society has two of these Mars stations so far. There's the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah and the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station, F Mars, on Devon Island in a meteor crater in uh, the Canadian Arctic. Um, F Mars is a lot more isolated. Um, the crew and supplies have to be dropped in by a C-130 plane. Uh, they do one-month rotations instead of two-week rotations, and you have to do um, you have to walk down to the stream to carry your water rather than having it delivered by by a tanker truck. So so we had it easy by comparison with them. Um, and I do know some people who've been to F Mars, and it's it's hardcore. I had originally thought that I wanted to go there, but having been to the Utah one. Um, I think that's about as far as I want to go. So, thank you very much. Um, I'll be hanging around if you have any more questions.